If your toddler has been diagnosed with autism or is waiting for a diagnosis, you're going to want to pay attention for the next 60 seconds. Happy Ladders is parent-led early autism therapy that empowers you, the parent, to teach your toddler essential developmental skills through play. Studies have shown that the parent-led model is highly effective while eliminating frustration over long wait lists or the worry about losing precious developmental time, all without the disruption of people coming into your home. Happy Ladders includes activities that target 150 essential developmental skills every toddler needs, as well as assessments in four different developmental areas. There's also an exclusive community of parents just like you and professional coaching to ensure success for both you and your toddler. To learn more, get a free trial, and take advantage of an exclusive limited time offer for my listeners, visit happyladders.com. That's H-A-P-P-Y-L-A-D-D-E-R-S. Use the code THEAUTISMDAD at checkout to save 50% off the monthly membership. Plus, get a free one-on-one session as well as access to the Tantrums and Meltdown mini course. This is a limited time offer, so act now. If your toddler has been diagnosed with autism or is waiting for a diagnosis, you're going to want to pay attention for the next 60 seconds. Happy Ladders is parent-led early autism therapy that empowers you, the parent, to teach your toddler essential developmental skills through play. Studies have shown that the parent-led model is highly effective while eliminating frustration over long wait lists or the worry about losing precious developmental time, all without the disruption of people coming into your home. Happy Ladders includes activities that target 150 essential developmental skills every toddler needs, as well as assessments in four different developmental areas. There's also an exclusive community of parents just like you and professional coaching to ensure success for both you and your toddler. To learn more, get a free trial, and take advantage of an exclusive limited time offer for my listeners, visit happyladders.com. That's H-A-P-P-Y-L-A-D-D-E-R-S. Use the code THEAUTISMDAD at checkout to save 50% off the monthly membership. Plus, get a free one-on-one session as well as access to the Tantrums and Meltdown mini course. This is a limited time offer, so act now. My name is Rob Gorski, and this is the Autism Dad Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in. You guys are super awesome. I really appreciate you. I hope that as you are listening to this, that you are safe and healthy, and everyone in your orbit is safe and healthy as well. That's really important. My guest today is Alan Winnikoff. He is an autism dad, but he's also the author of a new book called Not Sleeping. Alan is here to not only talk about his book, but also talk about his experiences as an autism dad that helped to inspire his book. It's a fascinating conversation. I think there's a lot that is very relatable to uh, like what I was, what I've gone through as a parent, and I'm sure a lot of you will be able to relate as well. So yeah, stay tuned. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We're back, and uh, today my guest is Alan Winnikoff. Alan's here to have a conversation about what it's like to be an autism dad. We're going to talk about his journey uh, in parenting, and we're also going to talk about his new book called Not Sleeping. We'll get to that shortly. Alan, thank you very much for taking the time to come on the show and and talk to us about you. Oh, I really appreciate the time uh, and, and, and your interest in me and the book, Rob, so thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am the parent of two boys, fifteen now fifteen and twelve. Uh, my older son is, uh, I guess, what you would say is severely autistic. He's not verbal. We are currently looking for a residence for him. My younger one, who's twelve, is also on the spectrum, although high functioning, and we certainly expect him to at some point go out into the world. But it's been a very interesting experience, to say the least. My older one was diagnosed just around the time my younger one was born. He's two and a half years younger. So we entered into that world. And I think I, I, one of my memories of that is when we started getting early intervention from my older son, DJ, you know, we as parents, looking back on it now, we're the last to know. The experts, the therapists, they all knew. They didn't really say anything to us until he was a little bit older, uh, but they knew before we did. But even when he was young, you know, we kind of knew there was something going on. And I also, one of my earliest memories was taking him when he was about three to a, uh, a kid's musician who in the local library here, and he wanted to um, grab the tambourine out of the musician's hand. And he got hysterical when he couldn't, obviously the guy wasn't going to let him take it. And I had to take him out of the room. And I just remember that feeling where the other parents were like kind of holding their kids back as if we were contagious. I think that may be where I started thinking about someday I want to write about this because, you know, every parent of an autistic child knows the experience when you walk into the grocery store, especially when your kids are younger 
and they have a meltdown and other people, adults are sitting there or staring at you and that you can tell they all are thinking to themselves, your kid is so poorly disciplined. Why don't you just take care of your kid? We actually got a um, autism dog a few years ago. And as my wife likes to say, it kind of changed everything because once we had the autism dog with the vest that says healing autism on it, people reacted to us much differently because then it all became clear to them. But one of the reasons I wrote this novel is that um, for, for two, you know, sort of two sets of audiences, one is autism families, because I wanted them to understand and to know they're not alone and to be able to see themselves and say, wow, that really resonates with me. And then the other audience is neurotypical families who are the ones I just described. They're, nothing, they're not bad people, but they just don't really understand what they're seeing and they're afraid. Often they seem to fear autism, like it's something they can catch. So I wanted them to kind of understand where we're coming from also. And the, the point of the book though is it's from the perspective of the parents. And in the book, the parents are, are separated but they still need to come together to co-parent their daughter, who in the book is nine, who is autistic. They have to figure out how they're going to take care of this child, even though the autism itself is what largely separated them because they couldn't manage their marriage uh, while trying to be effective parents for their daughter. So these are not heroes, these characters in my novel. They're just people trying to figure it out. They have moments where they rise to the occasion and they have moments when they become overwhelmed and they do things they're not proud of. And I think that that's also part of the story for all autism parents is it's okay. It's okay to not always be the hero. You just kind of have to deal with what's in front of you and be the best you can. And, and it's a very, very challenging thing. It's relentless, but we all need to try to work at it. What has your experience been like as a parent to two autistic kids? I think it, you know, it's, it's like I, I say that, um, you know, when you're single and you get married, then the, you're sort of crossing the border of a country and that you've left that other country behind and your single friends, your friends who are still single, you can't quite relate to them in the same way anymore. Then you have kids and your couple friends who are childless, you can't quite relate to them quite the same way. And then when you are a special needs parent, it's again, you are separated from those neurotypical parents and who are raising kids. You know, one of the most painful things is that parents celebrate their child's milestones. But when you have a neurodiverse child, severely disabled like mine, you don't hit those milestones. And you see everybody kind of moving on and you're sort of in this groundhog day, you know, where you're still changing your child and still getting them dressed and still feeding them. It makes you see the world in a different way. One thing I will say is you don't sweat the small stuff because it gives you perspective. But I think just the relentlessness of it, the every day, because I think we're sort of programmed to, you know, once our children stop being toddlers to kind of shift a little bit. But with uh, severely autistic kids, you know, you never move out of that toddler stage. You're always dealing with the same stuff. But I think I am a, a more compassionate person and um, a more patient person than I used to be. Because if you're not, you're not going to make it for very far. People ask me all the time, like, what is it like? I don't know anything else. So I, I don't know. I don't have a yeah. frame of reference. Like, I know what yeah. my brothers and sisters were like growing up because I'm the oldest of six. I don't know what it's like not to parent a child that's on the autism spectrum. So it's like, it's like second nature to me. I just, I just don't know anything else. Did you have any unique challenges that you faced as you were going along? Every day, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That was a loaded question, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, again, it's um, sometimes people will say to me, and I'm sure you've heard this also, people, people say, do you ever ask yourself why me? But you know, you learn, that's just, that's not helpful mm -mm. because it is what it is and you learn to deal with it. And I also think that uh, everybody has something in their life to deal with. Some people might have a chronic illness. Some people might have uh, uh, an elderly parent they're taking care of. Nobody gets out of this life free, you know? Um, and that's actually a line in the novel. Um, everybody's got something. And my characters, both my characters, although they don't really get along the, the separated couple, they both say in different parts of the book to their friends, you know, that, that the why me thing is just not helpful. 
You know, you just find reservoirs of strength. Um, and that is, again, that doesn't mean you're perfect because you're far from it. And I have certainly had moments when it's been overwhelming, but you, you find a way and the love doesn't change. You love your child just as much as any neurotypical parent loves their child. I think what does make you sad is that you want your child to, every parent's goal is for their child to reach their fullest potential and to do everything that they are meant to be. And with an autistic child, those um, goal lines obviously shift dramatically. I've been bringing this up the last couple of times I've talked to people because, and, and I think it's really important with like what you were just saying. I've been publicly advocating for about 12 years now, I think. It's been about 12 years now, since 2010. So we're going on 12 years. I had a, a rather heated discussion with a dad one time who was a father to an autistic uh, young adult, teenager, like transitioning to adulthood that phase, he said that his son will never be successful because he's autistic and he will never be able to manage a business or have people working underneath him or, you know, make a hundred thousand dollars a year and have a nice apartment and stuff like that. And I thought, wow, like that, that is really awful. (laughs) And one of the things that I've learned along the way is to adjust my expectations for what what I thought my life was going to be like, right? Cause like nobody plans this and you have in your head, just like any other parent, like my kids are born, we're going to do whether they play sports or they're going to be whatever they're going to do this they're going to do this. You start, you start living your life in fast forward initially. And then all of a sudden it's like, you just hit a wall because you hear autism and at the time don't know enough about it to understand what that means. You just get really scared and you, you don't know what to do. And, and I just think like, it's so important that our goal not be success by what our standards are for our kids, but happy, healthy, adjusted, as independent as they can possibly be reaching whatever their potential is. And, and our job as parents is to foster that and sometimes level the playing field because I I think the playing field is unfair in a lot of ways, but we work to support our kids in whatever makes them happy. And we provide them with the tools that they need. And, and as much as, is I have taught my kids over the years, they have taught me so much more about myself and just about life in general. And I, I view life differently than I did uh, before I was a parent. Um, and it's, it's all, you know, all three of my kids are on a spectrum. So I, I never really had, I don't know. I don't know anything else. Like I said, so I, I really like, I really like the way you said that. And I, and I just wanted to kind of emphasize that because we, it's, it's about our kids and it doesn't mean that we can't live our lives. We can't find joy and happiness in whatever, because we can, we just have to pay attention to the right things. And I have learned the little things are so important. You know, the, the unexpected hug when maybe it's been a while since you've gotten a hug or uh, you hit a milestone that you have not hit for a long time and, and they tie their own shoe or they, you know, they, they come home and they have a friend or like just anything that most people wouldn't pay attention to. I've learned to focus on all of that stuff. And I was kind of wondering if, if you, if you noticed that in your life. Oh, no question. One of the things I've learned from observing my son, and I learned this early on with him is that there is some autism in all of us and you see the world through his eyes and you see how you are and other people are who are, you know, neurotypical everybody has some of this in them and it just broadens your scope, your perspective on the people that you engage with every day, because you realize maybe, you know, we are thought of as neurotypical, but we're all weird. I can see uh, he has opened my eyes in that way that I've seen that, which is, is very, very powerful. And he notices things, you know, my son's way into the world is, is music. And we'll be going for a walk and he'll stop and put his ear to a lamppost and drum on it because every vibration tells him something that is beyond us. And it's fascinating to watch this because he just, it's his way into the world. And I just, you know, he's getting, he's, he's getting some sort of communication, but it's beyond me, you know, what it is. I I would say that, you know, talking about this, one thing I did want to say is that you know, I think the other thing that happens is because he's not verbal, he, his receptive language is pretty good, but he doesn't talk. So he has, he's a little bit better now, but 
you know, he can always ask you for things. But, you know, people forget, I think, that he's a sentient being. He, you know, he has a thought process. He's, he is processing things. People tend to think of him as kind of like um, almost, you know, not a person. And we have to remember that, you know, he's, he is processing and thinking and having his own ideas. We just don't know what they are, and he's not really able to express them. And I think one of the things that really, if I could just, you know, wave a magic wand, I'd like to get inside his brain and see what is going on in there. Because I know there's a lot happening. I just don't know what it is. You can see the gears turning, and mm-hmm. you just don't know what's what the big picture is. I, My youngest was, um, he was originally diagnosed as nonverbal, and then it became sort of preverbal because he had, he made, he spoke in like musical tones and mm-hmm. it was like the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard in my life. And like, I could just fall asleep listening to it. Uh, but he didn't have expressive language. Mm-hmm. We then were told that they thought he was deaf because he wouldn't respond to anybody for the longest time. Mm-hmm. And so we learned sign language and we were, we were just adapting to meet his needs and find ways to sort of bridge that communication gap. Because even if he couldn't express himself or tell us what was wrong, he still had feelings. He still was scared. He still was upset. Yeah. He still was uh, hungry or not feeling well. And I remember feeling like so powerless because it was so hard to figure out what was going on with him. And I remember saying like, God, if, like I, if I could just see what he sees or, or just feel for a minute what he's feeling, mm-hmm. it would give me some insight into yeah. what I could do to either take away his pain or help him to, uh, find a, a way to you know, bridge some communication gaps and stuff like that. And, and I, I remember being very frustrated at times when people would talk about him, like he's not in the room, yes. you know what I mean? Like, like he doesn't have an opinion and he'll, he'll be the one who pops in here. Like we talked about before we started recording, mm-hmm. he'll be the one that pops in. He's, he's, he started talking at age four, um, four mm-hmm. and a half and just never stopped. Mm-hmm. And he, he wasn't deaf. He just ignored us. Like he tuned out mm-hmm. the world in, mm-hmm. in to such a degree that he failed all of his hearing tests. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it just, he just wasn't ready. And, and one day he just, he, he'd been absorbing everything the whole time and just was, was ready to kind of emerge into the world for whatever reason. And, and so like, I, I really feel it's so important to recognize that just because someone doesn't talk doesn't mean they don't feel. It doesn't mean that they can't hear what you're saying or, or experience all the same things that we do. They just have a harder time telling us about it. And, and that, I, I remember that being a very, that was a very humbling thing for me when, when he was little, because like, I, I just, that was, that was a hard thing for me to navigate. How have you guys, how have you guys worked out communication? You know, we tried a lot of different things. We tried pro loco and, and he would just stem on it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't really, even though he was trained on it, he wouldn't really do it. So communication, especially when he was younger, was so frustrating because he couldn't ask for what he wanted and he would just get so frustrated. Um, if he was hungry or thirsty or, you know, whatever. Um, and like I said, now at least, um, he, he can tell us, you know, if he wants water, if he's whatever he wants. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, we, he has to be prompted, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, we're still doing the, I want, and then let him finish the sentence. But I think it's some of the stress actually has, has, um, abated at least a little bit because now we can, we can figure him out pretty much. And he can, the other day I, I was in my office where I am now working and had the door closed. He was with his caregiver. And I don't know where she was, but I just heard him, heard him say, you know, hungry, 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 hungry. <laughs> like, and, uh, you know, he, he does not have a lot of patience, um, you know, when he's hungry or thirsty, but at least he got it across. And, you know, that was actually a good thing. Emmett's my youngest. And we had got him a boxer puppy because I, we, like, I wasn't sure what his life was going to be like because we were still trying to figure a lot of that stuff out. And I wanted him to have some kind of like companionship, even if he didn't fully like embrace everything. And that dog, I think is what brought him out of his, his shell. And, mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a very, 
it was a very cool experience to hear him say dog was his first word mm-hmm. for the very mm-hmm. first time. And so I, I guess, I guess my point is with this is I understand a lot of what you have experienced and, and what you're going through. And I wonder, but how did your experience personally sort of shape the characters in the book mm-hmm. and shape the story and the struggles and the, all that stuff? So, you know, even on the cover of the book, because it was also in my query letter to the publishers that I sent it to, I, I, I was inspired and I almost named the book. I almost titled it, I called it Not Sleeping, but I almost called it 70%. My wife said, no, it's a terrible title. So they didn't do that. But I had heard early on when I would go to um, therapy, like music and art therapy with my son and other parents, we'd all be sitting around in a room waiting for our kids to finish. And this number, 70% kept coming up. 70% of special needs couples break up because the pressure is just too great. And it just, it just, you know, couples can't be couples anymore. And one of them decides that it's just too much. And so they break up. And I don't know whether the 70% number is true. I tried to research it. I couldn't really tell. Maybe it's an urban legend, but it worked for me for the book because that gave me the idea that I want to write a novel about a couple that um, he, the, they just, they leave. And the man, it's the, it's Josh, the husband, the father who leaves. And the book is written from both their perspectives, Josh and Claudia. So it goes back and forth between their third person um, perspective, but he's the one that left and he left because he, you know, basically what you sort of learn in the course of the story is that, you know, he feels, of course he feels guilty about it. He knows he did a terrible thing, but he also feels like he has one life and that he's overwhelmed and that uh, this is not how he wants to spend, you know, the next 20 years of his life. Now, that actually is, you know, when I wrote the, the book, my publisher accepted the book. And then he said, well, you know, you don't have to make your character more likable, but you do need to make him more sympathetic. Because I think I had originally slanted him as being, you know, not a good person. So I tried to balance that out a little bit. And hopefully I did. But, you know, he's he's a guy that's haunted by this. Um but I really wanted to explore the idea of couples who can't make it and what happens because, you know, if you have a special needs child, you know, just because one of them moves out, there's still a lot of responsibilities. Um, and you're not going to be able to, you might think you can walk away from it, but you can't. Right. So, um, so that was really the, the genesis for the story. And the, the real goal of the book though, was not to write a polemic about autism. You know, it wasn't, I didn't want every page to be pounding the reader about, well, this is what, ought to, that's not what it is. You know, it's, 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 it's fiction. I wanted to write a story about two people trying to move on with their lives, you know, finding romance, working on their jobs, living their day-to-day lives, you know, seeing their friends, but they always have this, this situation kind of, it's always there. They're never going to, they're never free of it. And they always have to find a way to make sure their daughter is taken care of. So. That was, that's kind of the point of the story is from the perspective of two flawed people, as I said before, just trying to um, navigate their way through the world while they have this particularly unique situation that is, is never out of their mind. Marriage is tough to begin with. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. And when being a parent is difficult, you know, whenever I talk about this stuff, there are people who get kind of been out of shape, like like I'm saying that them being a parent to a neurotypical child is easy. I'm not suggesting that at all because no parenting is easy. However, when you enter the universe that autism exists in, it's it, that parenting is a, is a completely different experience and the stressors that it, that it puts on you is, is very, very intense. And it takes a tremendous amount of self-awareness, I think, and work to maintain your marriage for one thing, because it's very easy to get lost in, in all of the challenge and the heartache and the stress. It's very easy to to do that. I think that by doing what you did here, you're providing insight into what so many people ultimately experience, which is sad, but it's reality. And I just, I don't know. I've, I've never seen anything like this, right? Like, I've not, I know a lot of people who've been through that. I've been through that. I, I, so I know, I know that part of it, but I've never seen it explored like this before. And I just thought it was really cool because it provides insight into what could be if you don't make something work or you don't find ways to overcome your differences, or you don't prioritize 
uh, yourself and your partner and, and, and focus on things like self-care, which I is so important. Yeah. And I, I actually, you know, um, my wife and I, we are together. So people say, Oh, well, this has happened to you. No, it didn't actually, because we are still, I think we're still um, a strong couple, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we didn't feel the pressures. We certainly did. Mm -hmm. So, so the story is fiction, but one of the things, you know, like any fiction, you, you take a germ of truth and one section of the story describes, you know, how they, what, how their marriage was fractured after they had this autistic child. And, you know, so the way that, um, one of the characters describes it as first they lost friends because, and I've seen this, that, mm -hmm. you know, friends of neurotypical kids just, and again, they're not bad people. They just, they can't really hang out with you anymore. You know, you're in different places. Um, and you wind up hanging out with other neurodiverse families because as I, as I say in the book, you know, if, if a, one of the kids takes off their clothes and dances on the table, you just get the kid dressed again and go back to eating, you know, it's yeah. like, it's like it's a, a lot to freak out. <laughs> You know, it takes a lot to freak out autism parents. So, you know, first they lost friends, then they stopped traveling because not all, and not all autism parents do this, but some autism parents just are really afraid to travel with their kids. And then they stopped having sex because they just couldn't find the time and they, and they were so stressed and they were so preoccupied. They just couldn't find a way back to each other. And they forgot, you know, what it was that, that made them fall in love in the first place. And I do think that that happens. And again, I, I spent a lot of time talking to other couples, other individuals in these, um, when I, when I was sitting around in these therapy groups waiting for our kids and I, that's where I got a lot of this from. And I think a lot of it is, is it's so realistic and like, I realize it's fiction, but it happens, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what I, what I think you can do is you can gleam kind of like, um, it kind of gives you a glimpse of what could be if you don't, if you don't do what you need to do now. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, you know, sometimes people get divorced and they find ways of making it work and maybe it works better, you know, but I know the number 70 has been thrown around. I think it was like 80% for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then that was mm -hmm. debunked. And, but mm -hmm. I can't imagine how that's not true. Maybe it's not 80%. Maybe it's not always 70%, but if 50% of marriages failed to begin with mm -hmm. adding the additional stressors of especially when he's child, just the demand alone I can't see how that's not true, honestly. And it's not that the kids are bad or the kids, it's not the kid's fault. It's we're given a task with no instructions that, that humans truly, I don't think we're meant, I, I think being an autism parent is among the hardest things that a human being is, is capable of doing. And not everybody can do it. I, I think that much is very clear, but it's also, if you find your way, it's one of the most rewarding experiences that you can have, you get to view life in a way that I would not have viewed it had I not met my kids or had my kids. And, and it just, it's just an amazing experience. It's stressful. That's for sure. Not sleeping. That describes my life pretty accurately. <laughs> and, you know, I, I went through a separation and a divorce as well and, mm -hmm. and just finalized in February. Mm -hmm. And so like, I, I can, I can relate to a lot of this even though it's fiction, which is, I don't know, it's, it, it feels more realistic to me than, than fiction because you did a really good job. <laughs> Has there been a response? Like how, how are people, are they relating to it? Are they like, Oh my gosh, I know what that's like, or that happened to me or, Oh my gosh, I'm doing that. I need to stop because I see what it could be doing down the road or something to that effect. Well, you know, um, to use a, a, a word, it's, it's been all over the spectrum. You know, it's, um, the book just came out, so I haven't gotten a lot of reviews yet. I'm kind of waiting to see. Everybody kind of relates to it differently. I will say that, you know, I mean, there have been people that have said what you're saying, you know, oh, this is, you, you just captured my life. I also, um, on the other hand, there was a woman I was introduced to who was very involved in, in local autism activities around this area. I don't know her, I've never met her, but I was introduced to her over email. And she was like, we got to get this out there. We got to do this. We got to do all these things. And she was so supportive. And then I sent her an advanced reading copy last summer. And she just ghosted me completely. Like she must have found the book, I don't know, offensive or just too close. I'm not sure. But she would not. And I emailed her. I called her. I, she just, she has never responded to me after being so enthusiastic. So 
that's going to happen also. You know, you're going to get people that it's just, it's just, um, you can't, as a fiction writer, you have to write what's in your heart. You can't censor yourself. And, you know, that's taken me a long time to learn. You know, I, I, I've written fiction all my life. The little bit of success I've had has come in later life. And that's because I stopped doing that. You stop thinking to yourself, what's my mother going to think if she reads this? You know, you just put it all out there. But some people, it's going to be too much. Too, It's going to be too raw. And um, that's kind of the consequences you have to take. So, you know, and, and other people read it. Some people read it from a literary point of view. Some people read it, you know, from a strictly like, oh, this is about autistic parents. So, like I said, so far, you know, I've gotten pretty much every response you can get. That's interesting when you're talking about that, that person. I wonder... There are some people who, and I found this over the last decade, there are people who just don't want to talk about it because they feel like if you talk about my kid had a meltdown or my kid struggles with this, that you're somehow degrading them or, or people will think poorly of of them. And I, and I, I disagree with that because I think when we talk about these things, whether it's fiction or, or just real life stories, I think it affords us an opportunity to learn something and, and educate ourselves on what someone else's life can be like. So when you read this, maybe you sit there and you think, I don't want it to come to that. So I'm going to, you know, do this, this, and this, or maybe it's a wake up call and, and they can say, you know, like I, I want to not find myself in that situation. So this is what we're going to do. Or, or someone's in that situation and they realize like, my God, like I'm not the only, I'm not the only person out there that has gone through this because this is very realistic and I'm sure it hits very close to home for a lot of people. But that reminder that there's other people out there who are experiencing something like this, that they're not alone and stuff like that is, is really important. I think it sort of validates people in their feelings and their lives. And I guess what would be the one takeaway that you would want people to walk away from reading this? Like if there's one, if you narrowed it down to one thing that you feel is like the most important message, what, what would that be? I think I hope what people really get out of this is that um, uh, for, for parents of neurodiverse kids, autism becomes a part of our life, but it doesn't t- define us. Uh, and anybody who's thinking about reading this book may be surprised hearing this conversation because a lot of it takes place in both Josh and Claudia's work lives. They're both, they both have very demanding, busy jobs. They both have romances. So there's a lot more in the book than just the story of Amy, their autistic daughter. And I think that's what I want people to know, that we don't stop living our lives. You know, we still doing the same things. You just have this other thing that you need to make sure that you are really, really on top of and that you that affects your heart every day, but it doesn't consume you to the point where, um, you know, you're not functioning like, like other people. It's a whole other layer to your life mm-hmm. that, that is constant. I always tell people it's like 25 hours a day, eight days a week, 366 days a year for the rest of your life mm-hmm. in some cases. And it is, it, it just adds, it adds a layer of complexity to things that, that unless you're experiencing it firsthand, you just don't understand it. And mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be, like I said, I mean, we have our ups and downs. I mean, my life, I, I don't feel that stressful anymore, but I think it's just because I'm used to it. I don't know anything else, but I wouldn't change anything. I mean, I would learn from my mistakes maybe and do better as a father, but I wouldn't change my kids. I mean, they are who they are. And I just think there's a lot of lessons that we can glean from even a, a, a fictional story about fictional people raising a fictional autistic daughter and trying to balance their lives because balance is so hard. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of my biggest struggles is, is balancing everything out. How do you balance what your kids need versus what you need for yourself to be there for them in the first place versus work versus personal life or family and friends? Not a lot of people talk about that. And and this might be insight that would be otherwise unavailable. And, and it just, it just gives you, a glimpse into what people are struggling with. And and maybe it can provide you with the ability to be a little more empathetic or compassionate towards people who are dealing with something that maybe you don't understand rather than just judge. You know, I mean, it, it is, it's a, it's a tough thing, especially being a single parent. That's really tough to juggle all of those things. So I love what you did. Where can people find it? 
So it's certainly on Amazon. Okay. Um, you know, you can just Google my name um, or the name of the book. Um, it's also um, through my publisher, uh, okay. which of course I encourage you to go to their website and buy all their books. Um, that it's Crow's Nest Books, one word, crowsnestbooks.com. Okay. And you can find it there right on the homepage. Uh, and, and I will say that, I should just say this, that Crow's Nest is a small publisher. They're Canadian and they have been spectacular to me. They really, they're a publisher that just really uh, cultivates authors. So I'm very, uh, very grateful to them. And um, so I definitely urge people to check out their website. Very cool. If there are any specific links that you want to have shared so that people don't have to remember it, I can include all that stuff in the show notes. Sure. I think that this is an important read for anyone. I really feel like the insight that you gain is it's hard to gain it otherwise, because it's just, we don't, we don't talk about this stuff. And so we find ourselves in a situation like this, not knowing what to do, feeling like we're the only ones and having like no lit path to kind of guide us on the way. And, you know, I, I hope, I hope that people start talking about this stuff more openly so that, so that we can learn and gain those insights to help us, avoid those same pitfalls or, or make better choices and things like that. So um, is there anything else you wanted to tell us a, a, about it? Is there, is there like, I know we have the, the takeaway kind of message that you hope people mm-hmm. walk away with. Is there anything else you wanted to add? I would just say, if you want to read the book and you're, and you're thinking about yourself, I'm going to be overwhelmed with, you know, autism on every page. It's also, you know, it's got some, I think a pretty good office drama there's uh, it's a, it's a romance. Both characters are involved in romances. So don't feel like, you know, it's going to, the, the autism theme is um, going to just be hammering you over the head. It's an adult contemporary story. And I think uh, there's a lot of different subplots going on that people will like. And autism is just part of that story. Mm -hmm. And it, and it explains, it kind of explains the hows and whys Mm -hmm. of why things are the way they are. So yeah, I, I very well done. If you have any social links or a personal whatever that you want to share too, if you can get that stuff to me, I can include all that as well. Uh, Thank you very much for doing this for one thing. And then for coming on the show and and talking to us about your life as a dad and some of your experiences and talking about your kids and, and your book. So, well, Rob, thank you. And I know, you know, I, I do follow you and I follow you on social media. So, you know, you're open about your life, which I think we all so appreciate because you really are somebody that we look to. Thank you. So thank you for this opportunity because it means a lot. Oh, no, I, I, hey, I love one of the, one of the things that I'm trying to do kind of unrelated is, is get more dads to talk. And so having you on, even just as a dad and, and talking about this and your inspiration and writing this book that has such an important message, I think it, it hopefully will encourage other dads to speak up and to talk about what they're doing and and maybe write their own book or tell their own story. And, and I think it's really important. So I, I commend you for doing that. I think it's amazing. And I, and I hope that other people are as inspired as I am. So thank you. Well, I'll tell you one thing about that is that um, real quickly is uh, when my publisher, you know, they, when they first showed me a cut the cover, it was a very sort of stark cover. And I said, you know, and I pointed to a couple of covers from women authors. And I said, that's kind of more the style I'm looking for. And they were like, well, those are for women. And I said, you know, I'm a man, but I think I write like a woman. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, just, I I read a lot of women fiction writers and they kind of got that, you know, and that's where we, we went, we changed the cover. And I, I think that, uh, yes, I'm speaking for dads, but I think women will also be able to relate to it um, because it does provide kind of that psycho psychological insights that you find a lot from women fiction writers. Well, my best to you and your family. Thank you, Rob. You too. Yeah. Good luck with everything. If there's anything I could do to help, let me know and and I'll I'll help out when I can. And again, I'll have all the, all the information and and, uh, links to the book in the show notes below. So you guys check that out. And uh, I don't know what day it is. Monday. I think it's Monday. It all blends together at this point. Uh, Have a great week and I will talk to you soon, man. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Uh, My um, pleasure. My pleasure. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care, man. Have a good day. Okay. Bye. Bye. Before I close things out today, I just want to say thank you to Alan for taking the time to come on the show and not only talk to us about his book and the inspiration behind the book, but also talking about his experience, his personal experience as an autism dad. You know, I I think it's so important that we open up and we talk about our feelings and how things are going and the struggles and the victories and the challenges and the things that we overcome 
it's difficult to talk about some of these things. I get that. But there are so many people out there who can benefit from your shared experience. And, and Alan, I think that you're helping a lot of people by not only writing this book, but openly sharing about your experience. You know, I, I just, I, I hope that it encourages, especially other dads to come forward and just talk about what they're going through and how they're feeling and what their experiences are. It helps to provide comfort to everyone else and validation to people who are experiencing the same thing. And it helps us just to kind of remember that we're not alone. So thank you very much. Uh, his book, Not Sleeping, can be found at crowsnestbooks.com as well as Barnes & Noble and Amazon. All the links will be in the show notes below, so you just have to click and go there. I encourage you to, to check out the book. It's fantastic. Uh, as for me, you can find me at theautismdad.com. All of my social links are at the top of the page. Please subscribe to this podcast via any one of your favorite podcasting apps. Just hit that subscribe button. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please rate it. Uh, that really helps me to improve. So thank you for that. Real quick before I... Uh, end this. I just want to encourage all of you to please get vaccinated. The vaccines are free. They're available pretty much everywhere. It's so important to get this done so that we can get through this pandemic with as little loss of life as possible. It protects you and your loved ones. I'm fully vaccinated. I've been fully vaccinated for like a month and a half now. Uh, my oldest has been fully vaccinated for longer than that. My two youngest just went today and got their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. They're 12 and 15. So we're doing our part. And I encourage you all to do yours. You're allowed to ask questions. You're allowed to have concerns. Just get the answers from people who know what they're talking about. Uh, the CDC website, Children's Hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, all those places that are reputable and they deal with science, medicine, and fact. So please, please, please get vaccinated. I love you guys. Have a great weekend and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Autistic kids can sometimes struggle to learn new skills such as riding a bike, reading, or simply having a conversation to a high level of proficiency and automaticity. Brainiac is a brain enhancement program that gets to the root of the problem. It builds stronger brain and body connections that elevate learning capacity within four to six months. Brainiac cross-trains motor movement, visual, auditory, and cognitive thinking connections using fun, interactive video games. Strength and connections allow kids to learn new skills and perform them automatically with more confidence and greater independence. Brainiac is for homes and schools. Visit canoe.com, that's K-I-N-U-U dot com, and be sure to use the code theautismdad at checkout to save $500. It's a limited time offer and it will expire on May 31st.